Welcome to Nukipedia's podcast by Junk Radio. Nukipedia is the Fallout wiki at fallout.fandom.com. Merry Christmas, everybody. On the 1st December episode this month, we have our regular news segment followed by Fallout History with Layman's Rain, Goddess Nerd and Ellis bringing to life the romance of David and Rose. Then after a brief break, I'll be back with an interview with Jess Starr from the Fallout feed. She's also from our dramatisation of the tragic mystery of the Mistress of Mystery and so many more Fallout creator projects they're just impossible to number. Later in December, we'll be talking to Stealth Dick about his Fallout New Vegas mods, and LS will bring you Creature Feature focusing on Nick Valentine, so make sure you subscribe, like, and ring the bell so you know when we're publishing those. The big news this month, of course, is that Nuka World is out, so hopefully you've all been playing that. Those worried about the removal of some illegal legacy mods have received a bit of respite. Stay tuned and we'll let you know any further announcements. Fallout Fan Audio Once Upon a Wasteland has been nominated for a Signal Listener's Choice Award for writing. This Fallout 76 love story needs your support to get over the line. You can find more information on their website at onceuponawasteland.com. Winners are expected to be announced on January 10. As we record this, we're eagerly awaiting the start of the second annual Fallout Film Festival. You can find out more about what happened on Twitter at Fallout Film Fest. Fallout for Hope this year is on track to raise over US dollars for St Jude Hospital. St Jude's focuses on childhood cancers and other life-threatening diseases, and their work is vital to families all around the world. If you're looking at streaming anything or creating any Fallout content, make sure you're talking to them to see how you can work together. You'll find them on Twitter at Fallout for Hope. Nukepedia's Nukepedia of the Year nominations are open this Monday. Visit us on the wiki to nominate people who you think are deserving of recognition. And lastly, although we have received this information a bit late, we would be remiss if we did not recognise the passing of King Clyde. King Clyde was an administrator at the vault before the wiki divided into both Nukepedia and the vault and stood up to lead Nukepedia through the transition period and use his wisdom to settle disputes. The wiki has been lessened as a result of his absence, and we all miss him very dearly. It's December 2082, just after Christmas. Charleston, which had survived the Great War, found something it could not survive. We lost almost everything. Our homes, our supplies, and most of our friends and family. The days and weeks that followed were the hardest of my life, but somehow we held together. We kept the idea of the responders alive, even though there were only a handful of us left. That's the story of the Christmas Flood. Tell your children. Tell everyone you meet. Let's keep the memory alive for as long as we can. This flood was not natural, but man-made. Made made by a man mistaken in grief in a way that would doom the one whom he loved. But how did it come to this? I'm Layman's Rain, and this is Fallout History. This month, we cover the Christmas Flood. Let's wind back the clock to before the start of a war, in an earlier time, with a romance. David Thorpe was an executive at Arctos Pharma. Foreshadowing his later role as a leader of the Cutthroats, he was known for a cutthroat negotiation style. I'll be the one who says when it's time to negotiate here. And our partners are only impatient because they need this deal more than us. They just hope we don't realize it. Now, go back to your desks and figure out how to get me that 80% or I'll find someone else who can. Although David had a wife named Rita and an unknown number of children, as CD executives tend to do in the movies and TV, he had a mistress on the side. But unlike those, this mistress was one he was madly in love with, perhaps as much, if not more, than his wife. While others prepared for the Great War, they prepared for a break to the mountains. Hey, turn it off, Rose. Do you want my wife to find out about this? Aw, come on. I want to make a recording of us. See if we're going to ditch that old hag when we get back anyway. (laughs) Fine. But it goes with you when we leave. And you need to promise to destroy it if word ever gets out about us. I have too much to lose in a divorce, and leaving evidence like that laying around will only make it worse. Oh, don't be an old stick in the mud. No one's going to find out. Pinky swear. Rosalind Jeffries, also known as Rose, was the object of his desires. There, trapped with limited resources as the world around them crumbled, They and other survivors quickly formed into a raider gang. This gang would come to be known as the Cutthroats. Their first leader, Harland, would not be enough of a cutthroat for David's tastes. 
When help finally reached the top of the world from the responders, David responded with violence. You saw what he did, Marty. He killed those innocent people who came to help us. He killed them in cold blood. And for what? A few measly supplies. The cutthroats put David on trial for this murder, but rather than convict him, the gang split in two. Those that followed Harlan became the diehards, who would avoid violence when they could. The cutthroats, now under the leadership of David and spurred on by Rose, continued their path of wanton violence. Rose would celebrate by gifting David an inscribed trophy. The relationship continued until December 2082. Seeking a present for her beau, Rosalind and a number of raiders led a small raid on Charleston. However, she was injured and captured by the responders in the city. In true cutthroat style, she attempted intimidation to get out of this predicament. David's going to come for me, and when he does, he's going to be mad. He'll kill every last one of you if he has to. So here's how it's going to be. You're going to let me walk right out of the cell. You'll send me off with, my, with a big bag of Christmas goodies to take home to my David, and maybe we'll forget this ever happened. Rather than being intimidated, Charleston authorities saw an opportunity to finally catch the leader of the cutthroats. Word was sent up to the top of the world. Somehow, David got the wrong end of the stick and believed that Rosalind was dead. As such, he decided to enact his revenge. A mini-nuke, stolen from the Brotherhood, was detonated on Summersville Dam, upstream from Charleston. A massive flood ensued, wiping out much of the city. Rose, too, would be lost in the attack. This, however, would not be enough to satisfy his grief. First, David would build a shrine, and then he would reprogram a Miss Nanny with the personality of his lost love. Much like the real Rose, this AI would share Rose's passion for David. Leadership skills, charisma, David was a full package, really. Not to mention a whole lot of tall, dark, and handsome. This robotic Rose would outlast David, however, as he fell to the Scorched Plague a decade after his mad act of passion at the Summersville Dam on December 24th, 2082. Once upon a time, 27 years after the bombs fell, there were two people, a vault dweller and a California girl. They met, and sparks flew. That's when things got interesting. Once Upon a Wasteland is their story. Follow Elizabeth Kirby and Odessa Valdez as they pursue their happily ever after in the post-apocalyptic Appalachian wasteland of Fallout 76. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and many other podcasting platforms. Once Upon a Wasteland, a Fallout 76 love story, available now. Um, so joining me is Jess Starr, one of the hosts of the Fallout feed and so much more. Jess, thanks for coming back for us. Thanks so much for having me. Happy to be here. Great. So normally I like to start interviews by asking what was your first Fallout moment, but we know you didn't start with one as you're playing that now, and I can see on the Beth blog that you started with three. What has it attracted you to the Fallout series? Well, it's interesting. I came into Fallout via Bethesda, so it was actually Bethesda starting to work on the games that attracted me to them in the first place. I'd love to say it was the aesthetic, the post-apocalyptic nature of it, the retro future for sure. But really, I was a dedicated Morrowind and Oblivion player, so this game Fallout 3 was coming out, and I said, I really need to try that. However, once I did, yes, it instantly grabbed me. And I really think it's the dichotomy of the kind of cheerful nature of the writing, the slight humor, the hope against all hope against a really dark and bleak backdrop. It certainly is unique that way. <laughs> There's really not much like it, no. So, of course, we know you from the Fallout feed, the United Wastelanders Network, Dames Who Game, and you've helped us get a channel record when you performed there as the Mistress of Mystery herself. And you were, of course, in the first Fallout debate there as well. What have I missed, and how do you find the time to do all of this? <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Yeah, I do tend to get my paws into a lot of things. It's because I'm not just a fan of Fallout, which I am, but I'm a huge fan of the Fallout community. And so I find myself getting into all these creative projects, sometimes leading them, sometimes helping them. I just really love encouraging people and making connections. 
So you mentioned the fallout feed. We're actually coming up on 400 episodes in just a month or two. That's a long time. <laughs> it is rather seven and a half years. The feed started just before Fallout 4, I believe July of 15. And then United Wastelanders Network, which is my Twitch channel. And we have a number of people on there. We focus on Fallout exclusively. A lot of Fallout 76, camp building and such is kind of my specialty. Beyond that, we play the other Fallout games. I do what I call Wasteland Retro, currently playing Fallout 1, as you know, but I've done 4 and New Vegas as well on the channel. Along with friends, we do other shows, sometimes game shows and events, PvP, grinding the scoreboard, stunts and dares, all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, that's why I call it a network, because it's not just me. I have friends who join for all kinds of fun. Second podcast you mentioned is Dames Who Game, which I do maybe six to eight times a year with a number of my girlfriends. Uh, we cover general gaming, but a whole lot of Fallout because that's how we met. Besides all that, I'm active in the building community. I love virtual photography. I do more of that than most anything else. I have a YouTube channel I don't do a lot with, but I enjoy that and seeing other builders on YouTube. I admin a couple of Facebook groups for building and general Xbox, and uh, just love meeting and talking to other gamers, really. So you asked how I find time for all that. Well, I often say the best way to not play a game you love is to make content around it. Content creation does eat into your gaming time. And also a lot of times you'll just be playing for fun and realize, wait, I should make a video out of this or for a purpose or, oh, I have to play these quests because I need to get it done for the podcast. But it gives you direction. And ultimately it's really rewarding and worth it. Watch much TV. I read a bit. I play games, go out and do stuff with friends, go dancing here and there, but not as much as I used to because, well, I live in the wasteland <laughs> and there's a lot of great people there. So it's worth it. Awesome. Great. Um, so out of everything you've done so far, what would you say it is that you're the most proud of? Hmm. That's a good question. Part of me would like to say all of it, because as I said, I enjoy making those connections with people, but probably just getting started. I know that might sound odd. But as a creative, actually putting yourself out there to talk about it in a more public way, whether it's recording your first YouTube video, whether it's hitting go on your stream and going live, uh, that kind of thing, it takes a little bit of courage. And so I'm proud I found the courage to do that and have hopefully encouraged others to as well. Really out of all my projects, I think streaming is probably my favorite because of the fact that you get to not only enjoy Fallout Live, you get to connect with an audience and talk to them while doing it. Get that back and forth, get that encouragement, find out what they're curious about with Fallout, ask your questions, hear what they think. And it's that kind of mutual creation that is really the most fun. I totally get what you're saying there. I know when I started doing interviews, I, I would come into them thinking, oh, no, I really don't want to do this. I'm too nervous. But then the minute I've hit record, suddenly something inside changes and everything just works out. So I totally understand and agree that just getting started is certainly a big thing to try. <laughs> It really, that first step is the hardest part. Even I have friends who have been streaming for years and they still have days when they don't want to hit the going live button. They're nervous about it. Is my hair right? Do I have anything to say? Am I in a good enough mood? And I mean, sometimes the answer to that might actually be no and you don't want to, but most of the time it's just jitters. <laughs> you get over it and you make that connection. So just on that, the times there that you find that, that it all gets you down and, and what is it you do to perk yourself up? That's a good question, too. Uh, one of my tricks, I mean, if you want to call it a trick, is the fact that a lot of my projects involve other people. So kind of like when you're doing a weight loss regimen, trying to get out there and exercise, you have an exercise buddy. Um, on UWN, it's United Wastelanders Network because I have friends who join me for a lot of streams. Not all of them, uh, but for several of them. And same with the podcast. It's not just me there talking. It's myself, Andrew and Ray on the Fallout feed or my dames over on Dames Who Game. Or when I guest, I find doing things with other people, if you're not in the headspace or excited about the topic of the day, you will be once you get others' excitement. And so you encourage each other. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I know when I'm listening to the stuff that the other people on this podcast do, a lot of that just amazes me and helps give me the boost there as well. Isn't that um, the best? So, <laughs> I, I know. Really, I love what you're doing with Junk Radio. The idea of using different segments like you do, bringing in the bestiary, all creatures, great and small, all of that stuff is really fun. It adds some diversity to it. Some of our podcast episodes are like that. We have a segment we call Terminal Velocity that we only do occasionally, but it'll be someone reading a terminal, getting that lore right out there. It can be a little dry, but 
but it's fun. It mixes it up. I really mm. like what you're doing and I can see how that would work together. Do you do most of the arranging for your podcast? I am. Um, I don't like to use the word producer because we I want the podcast to be sort of like an almost autonomous collective. So I don't have like authority to say, yes, you should do this. No, you shouldn't do that. But I am the person who puts it together and tries to make sure everything's on time. Yes. <laughs> I'm hoping it will evolve to be a little more decentralized. So since you are seemingly one of the fairy godmothers of the Fallout Creator Universe, what would you say is the smartest thing anyone looking to get into the creative community should do to make their lives easier? Touching back on what I said previously, not going it alone. If your projects are solo, if you're doing a lore video, if you're just showing off one of your creations, if you want to show people this cool thing you've discovered or share your virtual photography, but networking, not just not going it alone, but Popping into other people's streams, watching other people's videos and commenting, becoming part of a community, because when you support others, they tend to support you. I, I totally agree. And so for those who don't know, I was rather big in the wiki community a few years ago, and then I walked away for various reasons. And then when I've come back, I found everything's completely different. And finding this Fallout 76 creator community that is so <laughs> would have just blew my mind that this, this was not on the radar when I left. It's really exploded. It, it's so interesting because Fallout 76 as a game and as a sandbox is a great platform for people who love Fallout, but in a specific way where they enjoy making their own stories, making their own fun. Because there's a lot to the game, sure, but like any online game, any online sandbox, you eventually run out of content and you can keep replaying. But if you take any of the other Fallout games or RPGs in general, a lot of us who are fans, we replay them regularly. But say you jump into Fallout 3. You're playing through, you've got your two month playthrough, maybe three if you're doing everything, adding a lot of mods. <laughs> mods are a whole nother game. But then you're done. You put it away, you do other things for a year. Well, a lot of times people playing an online game like 76, they don't feel like they can do that. You know, there are motivations built into the game to kind of log in every day to get your prizes, claim stuff in the item shop, or just because this is where your friends are. This has become a social space and not just a gaming space. But when you're hanging out with your friends, what do you do? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. One uh, of the things that people do is coming up with something creative. Maybe they start making role-playing stories. Maybe they start a theater troupe. <laughs> Maybe they decide mm -hmm. to start streaming and share those kind of things or run game shows, do races, have building competitions, that sort of thing. And I really feel like that's where the creator community sprung out of. People who love mm -hmm. Fallout, who liked 76 and fell in love with the community they found there. And they needed to come up with things to do together. While there's a lot to the game, like I said, you don't want to keep playing the same game nonstop without new content, so you make your own to fill in the gaps. You, you mentioned the theatre troupe there, and uh, those of you who missed it, I think our first interview was with the Wasteland Theatre Company, and I know you've been a big supporter of them. Yes, Northern Harvest is a friend. He's the leader of the troupe, but he always likes to be very inclusive about the troupe as well. Even though I'm not on PlayStation, I've joined in both of their sonnet festivals. I actually, the Fallout 5.0 has done the streaming for the live plays. I've done the streaming for the Sonnet Festival, and uh, that was really fun. The last one we did, bringing it together across PC, PlayStation, and Xbox to get all on the channel. That was really exciting. I'm a bit shocked to find there are fight clubs, but it makes so, sense. So, at the El Gato Pub Fight Clubs, one of the things I really enjoy in game, I've really mm -hmm. enjoyed Nuclear Winter. I just talk, speak mm -hmm. on that real quick for my 76ers who miss it as well. The thing about Nuclear Winter, and one of the reasons it went away, was never a large enough percentage to necessarily justify the upkeep it required, because anytime something is tweaked in the main game, a lot of that mm -hmm. code was shared, and it had to be tweaked and maintained in Nuclear Winter with a slightly different code base. But the point is that a lot of people who played Nuclear Winter are people who had been playing for a long time, people who were looking for something to do, something that they would really enjoy, mm -hmm. and Nuclear Winter provided that. So we mm. still have PvP in the base game. And at El Gato Pub, we do what we call catfight nights. So there are a lot of rules. We have to have people strip down their armor, take a Radex to remove any mutations. So everybody's on a level playing field. And then we get in the mm -hmm. ring and box. And we've been doing that for three years now. One of the highlights, <laughs> I'm not the toughest, but I am the champion of the featherweights. And uh, I won mm -hmm. that the first year or two. And I announced regularly and work at the pub. One of the highlights was last Christmas, I jumped in and we did a stream with the Bethesda channel and got to get in there with Lady Devon, community manager and Havoc, who she now goes by Jessica Havoc more, but she is a well-known wrestler and a member of the Fault community. And she and I went at it on the Bethesda channel. 
And it was pretty hilarious. A midday fight for Christmas on Bethesda Twitch. And I ended up winning, which I felt a little guilty about. But it was it was fabulous. Was it in the full like wrestler style with the overacting and everything like that as well? A bit of that. A bit of that. We try to make it dramatic. We use replays. We use everything. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So I, I know you've seen a lot of different creators do a lot of different styles. Is there something that you think another creator does really well that hasn't really got enough attention that we can help draw a bit of attention to? Oh, so many, right? So many people out there creating and only their friends really get to see and it would be wonderful if they got the recognition they deserve for how great their art is. For instance, there's a virtual photographer, or two of them, that we see lots of pictures from on Instagram or Twitter. Jazara and Just Inspired Fallout. They take some of the best action shots in the community. That's what they do and people recognize it, but they don't get spread as wide as they should in my opinion. Or my friend Reckit Renee. She's a mid-sized streamer on Twitch like us, but <laughs> she's been streaming for, gosh, a year or two longer than I. And she comes up with the most creative things to do in game to keep her community entertained and excited. She comes up with her own shows, whether it's a dweller drop where you're essentially playing human lawn darts, pushing someone with your fist across a course to see who can push someone over the line first, like a multi-person relay, all kinds of things. She's got a new one, right? That she's calling the Dirty Derby, where you're actually using an object in game that's essentially, well, it's like a little derby race where you're betting on the ponies and they run across and it's truly random. Which one's going to win? We can't find a pattern. And so she's doing something where people actually bet on which one's going to win and then whichever one does, they get a prize and then she has to do an activity. Things like that. My friend Scullyface as well. She is kind of like us at UWN where she likes doing shows. Instead of just streaming, she shows things off. Camps, talking to people in the community, teaching people how to build, building things with friends live on stream, stuff like that. She doesn't just focus on Fallout, but it's a big focus. I'd also like to mention Irresolute Cartographer. Are you familiar with them? No. Okay, so he has a YouTube channel and he does deep dive lore and history videos. A lot of it is location history, as in locations that have appeared in Fallout games, and then here's the actual history. And then occasionally he'll do a deep dive lore video on the history of a location in-game and the NPCs and characters. He has a great YouTube channel, and I really enjoy it. Awesome. I will definitely be looking into those, and we'll try and get some links down in the description to those there. I don't know if you're familiar with the Disney creator community. There's someone in the Disney creator community called Molly McCormack, and she has adventures in all the Disney parks and just chose style. I'm just like, I wish I could write something like that. You know, maybe someone going around Nuka World or other locations just in her style, but I can't write like her. I mean, I don't think anyone can write like her because everything she does is completely off the cuff and amazing. That sounds fantastic. Yeah, I really do. Talking about writing, we touched on audio dramas a little bit. Other creators mm -hmm. that I feel could use a little bit more attention are people who, even before the current crop of audio broadcasts, Once Upon a Wasteland, Chat of Fallout 76 podcast, The Modus Files, oh, which I do a little bit as well. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Some of the older shows like West Vault Radio uh, by Laura or Mind Fog by Aaron Clow, those are fantastic and were written and produced mostly during the early days of Fallout 4. Oh, awesome. So I'll make sure we include those in the description. So now just for those who are, for whatever reason, aren't following you already, how do they find you on social media? You can follow me at Sleep is for T on Twitter. That's at Sleep is for the letter T. It's short for actually a Doctor Who reference. Sleep is for tortoises. <laughs> I'm a huge Whovian as well. You can follow my Twitch channel, United Wastelanders Network, all spelled out, all one word. It's a mouthful, but you just give us a follow and bookmark it and you never need to type it in again but we're also on twitter at you wastelanders and finally if you just type in jessica star and fallout you can find me all over the place great well thanks very much for joining us again and i know i'm eagerly waiting for the feed to get up to junk town i can't wait to see what you think of junk town and the hub well you'll be excited because we just hit junk town last night <laughs> That episode will be out soon. We discuss it a little bit. My compatriots have gone all through Junk Town, and next week we'll be listening to some feedback on what happened with some of our listeners who did that, and I'll catch up myself. <laughs> awesome. I don't know if I'll use this bit, but the whole reason why I actually got into Fallout directly relates to Junk Town. It was a friend of mine who said, you got to play this game. It has Richard Dean Anderson in it. And as someone who grew up in the 90s, it's like, oh my God, MacGyver! <laughs> or 
for those of you who are a little bit older, maybe Stargate SG-1. <laughs> That's fantastic. Love it when those voice actors show up from other properties. <laughs> They're like little mm -hmm. Easter eggs. There are so many Easter eggs in the games. And mm -hmm. I have to say, going back to Fallout 1, one of the most exciting things about it is discovering how much the texture, the fabric, the lore of Fallout in 3 New Vegas 4 76 started in the first games. I've always heard that from people, that so much started there, but actually seeing the origins of these sort of things, whether it's traditions, whether it's brands, it's just really, really neat. Tales yeah, of a junk town, jerky vendor, you know? <laughs> Yes, it is amazing just what gets picked out later. Things that seem minor and inconsequential, like Nuka-Cola, it's almost not present in Fallout 1. I mean, it is there. There are the occasional bottles and there is one Nuka-Cola addict, but it's not the phenomenon that it is in the later games. It becomes such an icon, doesn't it? Red Rocket, Nuka-Cola, that bottle shape, everything about it. I mean, caps have to come from somewhere. Absolutely. And just when you are listening out for voices, try and see if you can spot Raymond's brother from Everybody Loves Raymond. He's in there somewhere. No, really? Oh, yeah. I will listen for him for sure. Is he a claymation face? He does have a claymation face, yes. Excellent. All right. Well, th thanks very much for joining us there, Jess. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And as always, please remember to turn off your Pip-Boy.